Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is Arthur de Cordova with Zeal and Ketch de Gabriel, former director of operations with Los Sueños Farms. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter and uh, make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. Catch, I'll start with you. I always like to start with a little bit of background and uh, particularly about one's journey to the cannabis industry. So what was it that first got you interested? Uh, so in around 2014, a, a good friend of mine and my dad opened a dispensary in Colorado and then it... Uh, kind of snowballed into an outdoor farm in Southern Colorado that sort of quickly grew to be to what was at the time the largest cannabis farm in North America. Um, we were farming outdoors and uh, there really wasn't any equipment or machinery scaled to handle what they were doing there. Um, so I was asked if I could come take a look at the process and just sort of help pick equipment and figure out what we needed to do to really scale uh, a large outdoor cultivation and 2015. So in 2015, without a lot of information out there, how'd you go about doing that? Oh, it was, uh, it was not very pleasant. Um, it was a lot of homemade jerry rig drying rooms and, um, a lot of piecemeal together trimming equipment and, you know, just having basically no processes in place those first couple of years. You know, it was difficult to train people and, to, of course, to have skilled labor that had worked on a cannabis farm outdoors at that scale. A um, lot of lot of great indoor cultivators in, in Colorado. But at the time, um, we definitely struggled to, uh, you know, have the equipment and people we needed to harvest in the time frame we had. Did it get better? Yeah, it did. You know, every year for, for multiple years, we made better equipment and we... We kept inventing stuff on our own at the farm and developing processes. And, you know, eventually we, it kind of turned into a nice, well-oiled machine, as oiled as a cannabis farm can be. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, we had it down pat. You know, harvest came and it wasn't like this big struggle um, pending an unprecedented weather event or something like that. You know, we, we were able to sort of have business as usual, even though we only had harvest once a year. So it... Uh, it definitely got easier over time. Arthur, how did you come to cannabis? Uh, serendipitously, I have uh, swung from many different limbs. I was in Wall Street in the 80s. I was uh, living in Russia for most of the 90s. I was country manager of AstraZeneca, so I was in Big Pharma. And then came back to the United States in the knots and was in commercial solar, working with large companies like SunPower. Uh, doing strategic accounts. And I hung up my spurs and I got a call from a gentleman who was the chief technology officer, one of our previous clean energy companies. And he said, hey, I'm out here in Sacramento and we've just let go of our uh, CEO. Can you come out here and you know do X, Y, Z and help us write the ship? At the time, that company was funded by a large uh, Boston private equity firm. So I uh, jumped in my car. I was living in San Francisco at the time, and uh, came out there to 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 see you know this was possible to uh, to save. And the company was using radio frequency for pasteurizing foods, and they they've made a lot of mistakes. Um, it was a startup, uh, but they made one accidental successful mistake. And that was the gentleman here, Catch to Gabriel, had approached the uh, the company at a food show in the Central Valley. And Catch, I don't want to uh, uh, steal your thunder, but uh, it was Catch's prodding this company for a solution to a problem at Los Buenos Farms, not at Los Buenos specifically, but to the industry of how do we meet regulatory compliance uh, for microbial pathogens. At the time, MED, Marijuana Enforcement Division, had just implemented a regulatory framework, and it was the first state to go adult use. And so the industry was scrambling for solutions to meet that regulatory hurdle, and they approached 
uh, the previous company RFB and said, can you, can you uh, help us out with using your technique, not for foods, but I think it'll, it'll do the same trick for cannabis. So to answer your question, did I, uh, the company decided to, uh, to exit the space and because uh, the success story in cannabis being their, their one, one thing they can hang their hat on, but the investors did not want to participate in the company in cannabis, they were going to close the company. So I stepped in with that partner and we acquired that company and we, we pivoted uh, and rebranded the company to Zeal in 2017 and, and focused almost exclusively on the cannabis industry of providing a solution. Is the cannabis industry closer to Wall Street in the 80s or Russia in the 90s? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, let's just say that uh, living in Russia in the 90s, uh, I lived through uh, currency being canceled twice overnight, uh, bullet holes in my office window that were not there when I left the night before, but were there in the morning. Uh, you know, it was it was truly wild times. So I'm I'm not phased, and maybe that's why I I I, I went into this. It's like if I could deal with Russia, uh, I can certainly deal with whatever uh, cannabis market comes my way. And and you know, it's an emerging market still today. So if you're used to uh, uncertainty and can roll with the punches, it's a pretty good segue after Russia. So, catch. How did you turn a backpack full of cannabis? into the birth of RF mar- microbial cannabis remediation? <laughs> um, well, you know, as Arthur had mentioned, it, I believe it was in 2015, the Marijuana Enforcement Division said they were going to start microbial testing. Um, so, of course, as an outdoor farm, we immediately started doing our own testing and found out, okay, you know, this is something we, we have to contend with, um, you know, even on perfectly good-looking cannabis that has no mold on it of, of any sort. If it's grown outside, there's still you know, trillions and trillions of mold spores floating around at any given time that will go toward a, um, a total yeast and mold count. So really what we needed to be able to do is develop a post-harvest solution since we were outdoors um, that helped reduce our total yeast and mold count. Um, you know, there's various things that were available to the food industry at the time, and um, none of those were compliant with Colorado's rules or were really scalable um, for us. So, you know, I'd been been searching and experimenting with different things. I tried um, ozone, chlorine dioxide, and um, UV, which is sort of also ozone, um, uh, diff- multiple different types of, of gas immersions. And anyways, kind of coming up blank, but then at the Tulare Ag Expo, um, met the guys at RFB and, you know, they, they seemed interested. So uh, when we set up a time to meet with uh, RFB and now Zeal's uh, chief science scientist, is that her title, Arthur? Yeah. Um, we I went to California and basically rented some, some cannabis, a um, couple, couple pounds and, um, took it to the lab and we ran a, a litany of tests and took a bunch of samples and sent those off for laboratory analysis as well. Um, it was quite a funny experience because no one in the, in the lab had ever seen cannabis before. So, um, and at, at one point we had the settings wrong and, and we um, ma- managed to make, uh, make it smell like cannabis in there quite a bit. And it was a, uh, it was a bit of a funny experience, but uh from that, we did gain a lot of information, and, and really for us, we found, okay, this is a scalable technology that does what we need it to do. Um, now we just have to figure out how to make it work for our specific application with, within our process, and then, of course, um, you know, make sure it met the demands of the state and everything else. So um, that's that's really how the first testing went and how, you know, uh, some weed in a bag turned into a, a, a really robust and powerful piece of machinery. So when you say made it start to smell funny, did you set it on fire? Well, yeah, we did. And it, uh, it was actually because there was some metal shavings in part of the part of the product from like some trimmers or something. I don't even know where the, where the material came from. I just asked someone who I knew there, if I could, you know, rent something affordably. I told him I wanted, I wanted a little bit of it, but I was going to return it. I needed to do some tests. They thought that was odd. So, um, 
in any case that, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of metal shavings in there. What was the, Arthur, what was the early days of sort of coming together with a prototype that would work for the cannabis industry? The, the units that, and Katz mentioned the, the name RFB for RF Biocidics when it entered the, the, the nut industry, that was its, its category. They, they were making machines along with their OEM partner in Italy that were conveyor belts, uh, maybe, maybe uh, 50, 60 feet long. And those conveyor belts, you know, move the product through a, a chamber of radio frequency. So there's a heating component and a cooling component, but radio frequency, which is a thermal process, is really time and temperature, the D and Z values. And so there was no need to build a conveyor machine to do 2,000 pounds an hour for the nascent cannabis market. Maybe one day, but we had to pivot to a batch process. So think of a cabinet door and you could put five pounds of product in that cavity. And we lost the conveyor belt component, the, the time. So we had to you know, over a course of years of learning, you know, we were, we were kind of shooting in the dark with one hand tied behind our back, trying to get the right target temperature to achieve the efficacy and the, past, the, the kill of the pathogens. So we had to back up about four years in and say, this isn't working consistently. We need to replicate the time component. So through software, a lot of other innovations, we we're able to then replicate the time and temperature. But it took four years to get there. And now we have, uh, now we're, well, seven years in, we have consistent, repeatable, and predictable results. So it was a learning curve. And secondly, cannabis is a lot more complex than nuts for a lot of different reasons. I mean, after four years of shooting in the dark with your hand tied behind your back, did you ever think of abandoning it? Absolutely. There are a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and frankly, you know, we didn't know when the phone ring from a customer and said, hey, I've been using it and said, hey, we just failed our lot. And, you know, what's going on? And uh, we didn't have good answers. So at what point did you have a prototype that you were ready to go to market with? Was it, you know, after four years? And then what was that first product? So, so we were in the market learning commercially. I mean, we were getting good success, but, but not the same success we're getting in the food industry. And so we had the original model, which, which is still running today, but we changed the software. So the hardware was fine. It was the software, which was the magic key to unlock the success. So it has been the same equipment with slight modifications, though uh, the software is much more sophisticated and robust. And that's really the proprietary secret sauce, if you will, of our company. Catch, were you involved with this iterative process at all? And uh, at what point did you bring one of the, uh, the Zeal systems in-house? Yeah, ab absolutely. It, it was an iterative process, and um, we worked back and forth from the beginning. Um, my education and backgrounds in industrial design, so it was um, you know, something that uh, I was pretty familiar with. And, of course, as equipment manufacturers and producers, they were as well. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, it took a lot of testing is the main thing. You know, luckily we were at a large farm with a lot of material and we were able to generate a massive amount of data um, to figure out what the the right kill temperature and process time is. Um, and that that took some time. I think the, the most challenging part of it was in, in the beginning, the machine couldn't actually see live time what the um, or, or it couldn't adjust itself for what was going on inside the product and through modifications to the software and some very small hardware changes um, we, we were able to have the software be able to actually sense and and see what was going on in inside the the product and that that's when things really started to change and get much much more predictable but the the iterative process was was really trying to figure out what the correct moisture content is, what the correct density is, how do we pack this stuff, 
Um, you know, how long does it go in for? How do we, you know, what happens to the product when it comes out of the machine? And, you know, what, what are the, what's the aftercare handling to make sure that product doesn't get recontaminated? So not only was it um, a large learning curve of just figuring out how to adapt this technology to cannabis, which is complicated enough of itself, but it's also how to make this fit within a process and, and then later on how to make that work in other people's processes as well. So um, for something like this to work, it has to be sort of a holistic approach. And um, so as someone who is operating a farm, um, developing that process was time consuming and um, iterative. Were you able to stay ahead of um, total yeast and mold standards or did you have to use other patches in the interim to tr make sure that you remained in compliance? So radio frequency was the only thing we we ever used at scale. Um, I, you know, through R and D, I tried so many things. I, I don't even know how many things I tried. Um, but RF was the only thing we used at scale. The the trick with that is, you know, you can you can turn it to eleven, right? That's something you can do, and you can make just about anything pass if you do that. But there's the beauty of that technology is that you can walk a very fine line um, between getting the kill you want and also having the most gentle process possible. And, you know, cannabis is comprised of plant cells and volatile oils and it, 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 it those volatile oils, they can, they can go away at relatively low temperatures. So the goal is always to give the most gentle process possible while getting the most kill. And um, that, that was just something we had to learn and figure out how to do through iterative process. Arthur, what are the capabilities of the product lineup? What's your smallest machine? What's your biggest machine? And sort of, can you offer a solution from everyone from a small craft grower to, you know, a large scale operation like Los Sueños? Uh, it, it's a good question. The, and you, just, you know, what's your biggest and smallest machine? We only sell one size unit. Uh, the first generation machine, which is what Los Sueños uh, started with, and is still operating today with our with our customers was it had a very large footprint and frankly it was overbuilt for the needs of, of cannabis so it was a seven kilowatt system but that seven kilowatt in radio frequency i think the footprint is roughly catch correct me about nine feet wide five feet deep and 11 feet high it is a beastie piece of equipment now, fast forward, you know, while we were learning, we set out and, and running on 480 three phase power. So part of our product development curve was, yes, getting that software uh, appropriately uh, uh, created to have the repeatable, predictable, dependable results. But also growers were calling for a smaller footprint and wanted 240 power. And we wanted to also make it much more um, um, user friendly, I'll, I'll say user interface. So, uh, we went through a design process with, uh, a gentleman who started Apple's industrial design group back in the nineties, Richard Bruner, who runs his own firm called ammunition out of San Francisco. And so we have what's now a very sleek outside, uh, skin, if you will, it looks like a, perhaps a giant iPhone. And we, at it half the footprint uh so it's a it's a five four and a half feet by four and a half feet by eight feet tall and it runs on 240 power and we're so the original unit which required a forklift to put the generator up on top this comes you know literally plugged into the wall and play so we have uh we've made it a smaller machine but interestingly it uh has the same throughput as that larger machine what is the throughput again? It will do approximately five pounds of dried trim flour in a 15 minute cycle time. And the machine can run 24 seven. So we have customers say in Michigan uh, that are high volume producers and they have run, you know, 450 pounds in 24 hours. Wow. Um, what's the maintenance look like on the machine? Fetch. 
it it's virtually nothing which is is kind of kind of funny to say it, the really big industrial machines we had i mean they they just ran and ran and ran as long as we had the farm and are are still running now at um, other locations and uh yeah there's there's no consumables there's not really there's not really much to go wrong on them um they they utilize some fiber optic temperature probes and occasionally those need to be replaced but at, at least when I messed them up, it was usually because I shut them in a door or did something myself. But um, yeah, it's 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 good, robust technology, which is was really important when we were deciding what kind of technology to invest in at at our business. Is you know we didn't want something that had a lot of consumables and a lot of repeated expense. At, at the time, there were a lot of companies that were like leasing equipment and had these monthly maintenance plans for you know services or wanted some. Uh, other recurring fee and, um, you know, the ways you'll set it up and, um, the way the technology works is it, it, uh, you know, it just doesn't really require much ongoing maintenance. The a bit of backstory, Dave, I may just interject that. So radio frequency is not a new technology. So there was no quote technology risk. A lot of the, let's say equipment that comes in the cannabis industry has sort of been created for the cannabis industry. And that is not always a successful route. So the radio frequency, uh, there are only a few manufacturers in the world, but it really started after World War II. And it's a thermal process for drying textiles. And that's really where it sat for its first 40, 50 years. And then uh, the company we acquired, RFB, it stood up its company on the heels of a salmonella outbreak in the almond industry in California. And for those who aren't aware, California has 80% of the world's almond industry. The other 24, 20% is in Australia. So we have units in California and also in Australia doing just that, almonds and other nuts. But at the time, the only prevailing technologies, and it's sort of a mirror story of, of Ketch's telling of, of you know, how this technology was applied to cannabis, but, but predated another eight years from the uh, 2015 and the salmonella outbreak in California. And the only solutions were PPO, which was a carcinogenic chemical, and steam. So UC Davis, the agricultural university, was looking around because there's got to be a better way. And they identified radio frequency, thermal process, but had never been applied for food products before. So the company RFB was stood up to apply radio frequency to for pasteurization. And, uh, but the manufacturers of this uh, radio frequency had until then just been making the equipment for thermal drying of textiles. What is the ROI? And do you, is there an equation that is, you know, unless you make, unless you have X amount of yield, you should rely on like a service provider before bringing it in house? It, it's a good question. So without getting too wonky, uh, uh, reaching into my, my financial uh, chapter, we have a model on our, on our website where the user can plug in essentially three items. What's the cost of, what's the selling cost of their cannabis wholesale? What is their failure rate? And what's their volume? So if the volumes are high, you know, the you know the ability to use this technology you know financially and successfully is good or if the price of the cannabis is very high or if your failure rate is very high or a combination of those three you're going to get a very good return on your investment so i'll give you a very back of the envelope let's say someone that that, that cannabis is selling for eleven hundred dollars a pound but if you fail your microbial testing you would probably sell it to a manufacturer making oil. And manufacturers uh, for buying product for their oil aren't paying $1,100 for flour. They're paying $100 for biomass, the fan leaves, the trim, et cetera. That's a $1,000 delta. And if you have a uh, operator uh, who is 10,000 pounds a year and fails 10% or 1,000 pounds, that 1,000 pounds times that $1,000 is $1 million. That is the lost top line revenue. So our unit costs three hundred forty thousand dollars. So do the math. That's about four months. It pays for itself back. Okay, and I'm perfectly good with simple math. Just keeping it real tight. Did, did that work for you? 
That works perfectly for me. Okay. Um, you know, uh, catch, I'll pose this to you first, but one thing that I run into a, a lot in this industry is when it comes to microbial remediation, uh, it seems like it's typically surrounded in a lot of misinformation. Does this technology run into similar issues that we've seen with other technologies? Well, I, I guess it would depend on on what those other issues are. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't have the same issues that you know t gas types of treatment does, or or using ionizing radiation. I mean, any process you add to any process uh, comes with some negative externality, and the you know the goal of a process engineer is to try to minimize that and to try to get the best out of it. So, in, in my opinion, it's the best technology available at scale. Um, you know, if, if you only have a tiny bit of product, it's it's going to be overkill. There's probably something a little simpler you could do. But if you have a scalable business, you know, it's it's a very good option. Arthur, do you see that at all? Um, just I feel like the word remediation is a trigger for some people that think you're changing it. It's it, 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 we're uh, there's it the R the, I call it the dreaded R. So there's the kill step, and there's remediation, and and I'll just speak to each of them. The food, the milk industry is a good example. Almost all milk is is pasteurized before it reaches the shelf. Why? To prevent you know, uh, you know, salmonella or any other pathogens in the milk to protect consumer safety. It's there to protect the consumer. Does it mean the milk is bad? No. Is there a one-tenth of one percent chance? Possibly. But the industry doesn't take any chances because a milk recall is disastrous for your business, for your brand, and for the consumer. So they take the smart step. They take a preventative, cautious step, a kill step. The milk industry does not wait for a failure of a gallon of milk and then recall all the gallons of milk and then treat it so it can then resell it. So let's take that analogy and apply it to the cannabis industry. The smart, smart operators are using a kill step after everything is said and done, just prior testing. Not because they think their cannabis is bad, but just it's the smart thing to do so that they they pass 100% of their product in testing. Other operators elect not to do that, and I call it certificate of analysis roulette. They see what's going to happen. And, you know, there's good operators out there that are going to pass most of it, but, you know, generally between 1% to 20% will fail. Catch, I don't know if you second that, but that's kind of the numbers that that, that we see in terms of the yeah. industry. Yeah. I, I would I would say it's probably higher for most outdoor cultivators. Um, you know, if if the threshold's at ten thousand colony forming units, but yeah, certainly for for indoor yeah. guys. So you can, you can play that game and not not put in a kill step into your SOPs, and just see how you do. Well, that's very expensive because you have to retest it because you want to sell it. You don't want to destroy it, and you're certainly in the financial example I gave. You don't want to discount it ninety percent. Or eleven hundred dollars down to hundred. That's just throwing money away. So they they attempt to cure it after it's failed, and they put it through a system such as ours after it's failed testing. Well, that that earns them an R for remediation in metric. And then when that whole set, that uh, operator goes to sell it to a wholesaler or a dispensary, that dispensary can see that this lot has been tagged with an R. And guess what? They don't pay eleven hundred dollars. They pay. $800 because of the stigma associated with remediation. Because the consumer says, well, if it's been remediated, it's already failed. So it's flawed product. So again, it's not good to play the roulette game uh, because of the you know, price you'd have to sell it or, or get tagged with the R. So as uh, a lawyer famously said to me once, a litigator, when I was in litigation, he said, Arthur, it's cheaper to pay for your lawyering up front. So, um, you know, almost all of our customers, I would say exclusively all of our customers use our equipment as a kill step. And currently metric does not identify 
any technology used in the kill step in its uh, you know valuation in the in the in its metric uh, you know reports. Are there any fears over a change that would create that? Like instead of a dreaded R, there would also be a dreaded KS. It's a good question. I think it would be very short sighted by the regulators to do so, because they're 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 sabotaging best practices, right? And and so and where does it stop? How far up the chain do you go? Oh, you use this this uh, fertilizer for the product in your grow. You use this up here. There are a thousand things they could identify that quote the consumer should know about. But where's the line? This is actually the one. This is the one safety mechanism in place to protect the consumer. Okay. Catch, was the prototype really installed on 420 2016, or is that revisionist history? You know, I, I think that's when it actually was installed. Yeah, I remember wow. we had a good laugh on it. <laughs> that is just very serendipitous. Um, so uh, I was curious, Catch, about your um, transition away from marine design into cannabis. You know, what was it that caused you to make the move? Sure. I mean, it, it was really, you know, my dad and one of my, my very closest friends, you know, started started this farm and just, I, I had always asked, oh, you guys need to help, you know, you're planning anything. And the answer was always no and no for a few years. And then eventually after they grew 40 acres of cannabis, it was like, oh, oh my God, this, you know, we did it. Now what do we do? Um, and so I, I came out just to sort of take a look and help help source some equipment that other people had already been making. And I quickly realized, you know, at, at the time and, you know, 2015, n- nobody, nobody was making anything at scale um, that could, that could really handle that sort of volume without just a, a ton of, of people. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that really supported the transition um, that and the company I had been working for had, there had been some organizational changes there. And, um, you know, I had stepped away from that a few months previously. So, because the industry is so young still, and it was back then, Catch, was cannabis an engineer, industrial designer's dream, or was it closer to a nightmare? Oh, no, it was, it was a total dream. I mean, there's just so many relatively simple problems that needed to be solved. And a lot of it could be done by developing our sort of cannibalizing existing technologies from other industries and sort of tailoring them and applying them towards the cannabis space. Um, and, and there's still a lot of room for that. I mean, there's so many systems that, you know, I've thought of over the years. I mean, even in 2015 that like are sort of just now coming online um, and it, and it's great to see, but you know, the, when I was first starting to try to find equipment at the Tulare Ag Expo, I mean, that was one of the first big shows I went to. I mean, I, I remember just, I was, I was serious. I had real questions, but I mean, those guys, they wouldn't even talk to me. You know, they had, I tried to explain what we were doing. We needed a row planting machine, which is, you know, pretty standard for, for hemp and cannabis these days. And yeah, I couldn't get any of those guys to even, even take me seriously um, with check in hand. So it was kind of interesting to see how many um, companies that market to other industries have really sort of opened their eyes a little bit, just as the industry has grown and are starting to tailor things towards cannabis. But um, I, f- I find in general, there's a lot of, there, there's usually a lot to be desired in the process surrounding how cannabis gets to a certain machine. There are a lot of companies that make this widget in this machine, but don't really do a very good job of making sure it integrates nicely into an overall process because, you know, it, cannabis laws are just a patchwork across the country. And it, when you're developing equipment and machinery, you try to make it work for everyone, but with different laws, it can't all work exactly the same. So everyone's business model and production model is is different. And that's really not the case in agriculture. You know, most of those processes, regardless of what state you're in, are the same. So was it a dream or a nightmare? I would say the amount of areas there were to be creative and come up with solutions was a dream. The nightmare in it is that everyone in cannabis wants something right now or yesterday, and there's generally not much thought about harvest equipment until like July, August, <laughs> and then everyone's like, "Oh wow, we need you know 
uh, $5 million system to handle this that can't possibly build in that period of time. So um, creatively, it was a dream, practicality and, and execution just because of the rapid uh, demands of a growing industry. Um, we're, we're a bit nightmarish. Are you optimistic as to where the industry has, how far the industry has come in the last 10 years from a product development standpoint? I am, yeah. There's a lot of really good technologies that have, have come about and sort of matured. And a lot of the, well, not a lot, there's a, there's a few sort of original companies that have really stepped up to the plate and developed some very powerful tools and equipment. Um, and then just a lot of really smart people all over the country and, and the world developing best practices and processes. And, you know, as, as time goes on, that process will become more and more standardized. But without standardization and regulation, it's, um, it's going to be difficult for a lot of these really big machines that are made for large scale to um, to work for everyone. But yeah, I, I am optimistic in that you know one day uh, farming cannabis will be a lot more like uh, farming grapes. You know, you there's there's a lot that goes into it, but as far as the machinery, the equipment, and the process, you know, you've you've got something that's well defined to not take um, an excessive amount of you know of, of human labor really. Arthur, how much of the business is still doing nuts and how much is doing cannabis nowadays? Oh, it's 90-10. Uh, I'd like to just add something that Ketch said about the equipment. And yeah, there's there's equipment that's you know maturing, if you say, in, in the North American cannabis market, which is adult use. But Europe is 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 now going through its own curve. Uh, led by Germany and the cannabis reform law that went in effect April first, and all of the the EU and the UK are medical markets only, and there's is no adult use. So Europe is building a quote pharmaceutical market, and the standards for growing, or, or uh, growing, there's divided into the growing part is GACP, good agricultural collecting practices, and then once it's harvested into GMP, good manufacturing process. And I come out of uh, you know the big pharma, so uh, where I didn't think I'd be going back to again, and now we're back in the quote pharma game in, in Europe, and there the standards are much more rigorous. Think of a pharmaceutical factory, and clean rooms, and positive pressure. It, it's it's amazing. So the Europeans are doing it on a whole different level, and so the rigor of the equipment to meet the GMP standards is a lot higher. So I'm pleased to say, as part of our our product development in this next generation machine, uh, you know, we have equipment that not only, you know, meets you know the North American standards, uh, but the uh, pharmaceutical grade standards. So we have uh, operators in uh, Portugal and Macedonia that are GMP validated facilities, and so we've had to grow, you know, our equipment and our processes again repeatable, and it was a year long process to get it equipment validated that one customer. But uh yeah, the uh I'm happy to say the zeal's uh, growing with the times and uh we're now in a very uh strategic position, well well positioned strategically in Europe with this equipment for a medical pharmaceutical grade market. From a global perspective, are you most excited about the European market? And are there any markets in the US that you still find it uh enticing? The and, and catch re, re, refer to this. The North American market is a patchwork quilt of every state doing their own thing. There's no uniformity. That's very hard from a business planning to to operate. Uh, not so much for we as the equipment provider, but if you're a multi-state operator, very difficult because you have to build. If you're in 17 states, you're essentially building 17 different companies. You know, because 17 different production facilities because there's no, you know, no interstate commerce. So you're building 17 silos, 17 regulatory uh, quality control departments, very expensive. And then you add the financial burdens of 280E on top of that. It's really expensive. So the fact that some of them are breaking even right now is, is pretty remarkable. I am excited about the European market because it is a, you know, it is a consistent, pretty, pretty consistent rules across all it's the 27 minus one, 26 remaining countries in the EU. And uh, you can 
send product from this country to that country back and forth. So while Germany has demand today and it's being supplied from the likes of Canada, Portugal, Macedonia, uh, the Netherlands, of course, um, but they can send their product, you know, to any any country within the EU, and that that you can't do. So that that augurs well for a rapidly growing market with less restrictions. Where the U.S. market currently, for reasons we all know, has a lot of those restrictions that are business impediments. Arthur, do you have any expectations or predictions as to uh, when the landscape might change in the U.S.? <laughs> I think everyone has stopped making those predictions long ago. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, thank you both very much for being generous with your time today. I really do appreciate it. Um, Ketch, I'd like to start with you. You know, is there anything else in particular that you'd like to make sure the cannabis equipment audi- uh, cannabis equipment news audience knows about yourself or your work in the cannabis industry? Um, no, I, I don't believe so. I think I've kind of um, given you guys a good example of uh, some of the things that I've done there. No, I really appreciate it. And one thing I'm curious about, like, how did you consistently scratch that engineering itch? And, uh, you know, um, do you find yourself like, are you sort of the uh, constant entrepreneur? Like, uh, do you prefer the machine design part of the cannabis business? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I definitely prefer inventing equipment than to, to running a farm. I tried my hand at that. Um, and while it was a great learning experience, um, you know, I'm, I'm a designer and engineer by, by trade, and that's what I enjoy doing. Um, but yeah, throughout the years, I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of different projects and um, invent several first of their kind machines and, um, you know, do uh, make some cool stuff. It, it's been a lot of fun. Outside of the cannabis industry, what's the coolest thing you've been able to make? Oh, I built some pretty cool boats. Um, those are with very large teams, but... Um, Built some very cool, uh, anywhere from 55 to 80 foot carbon fiber world cruising catamarans, um, usually with all very advanced systems and sail plans and rigging. Um, so some of those projects are really interesting. Some some fully foiling boats I've been able to work on. Um, yeah, so I, I've really enjoyed a lot of those projects. Early well, on, we, we, on the, early on we, we nicknamed Catch MacGyver. And it still holds, whether he's in cannabis or outside of it. Arthur, how about yourself? Uh, before we get out of here, and the nickname seems definitely very well suited. Um, anything that you want to make sure that the cannabis equipment news audience knows about yourself or uh, Zeal? I am I am uh, fortunate that uh, I've I've lived and worked in some pretty exciting places. We talked about Russia, and. Uh, Cannabis for me, it might be my last chapter, but it integrates uh, everything from the finance side, my background, Wall Street, to the pharmaceutical side, to the strategic side, uh, s- selling, and uh, I, I, I thrive on the uh, shall I say the uncertainty. It, it, it meets my DNA, and uh, I'm very thankful. I'm I'm not a cannabis uh, smoker or, or user, but uh, I very much can appreciate the scientific side of the uh, of the business and what what it brings to a lot of people in in relief and uh, and better lives. So I'm happy to how, be part of that. How did your family respond to this final chapter initially? They're used to me doing crazy things. Very good. Normal normal people don't move to Russia. <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you both very much for taking the time, man. I I really do appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. And if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it to deliver to your inbox first. For Arthur Dikodorov, <laughs> come on, I'm never going to get it, Arthur. I'm sorry, Arthur. Uh, Dikodorova, D D Cordova, D Cordova. No, D Cordiva, D Cordiva, D Cordova, D Cordova. For Arthur <laughs> D Cordova and Catch to Gabriel, I'm David Manti. I apologize, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>